Thank you. Thank you, Dario, for that introduction. And thank you uh, to the uh, Mobile Ecosystem Forum for the kind invitation to speak to you all today. Um, you know, when TJ told me, uh, invited me to, to give this talk, he said, I really want to get the regulator into the room. And I was thinking, you might be a couple years late on that for me. Um, so I just want to put you all at ease. I am one of you now. I am from the private sector, and I'm here to help. Um, you know, actually, one of the uh, former federal official, another former federal official, when I went to a law firm, uh, he said, welcome to the dark side. Uh, but I think, I think maybe he got that backward. I don't know. It's what we're here to talk about today. Um, but TJ's topic reminded me of an old uh, law school exam that I had taken. And you, when you're a lawyer, you never forget those law school exams. And uh, this was in a, a legal ethics class. And uh, the, the basic uh, topic of it was, it was a continuing legal education class for criminal defense attorneys. Uh, and who shows up to this but a uh, prosecutor. Um, and it prompted this article in law.com uh, with the ominous title, Who Let Him Into the Room? Uh, and the entire kind of premise of the article was whether there were any problems with this notion of the wolf sort of cozying up to the sheep in this class. Um, but the legal ethics experts that were interviewed uh, for that article all agree this was actually a very good thing, that um, people who are on different sides of uh, the, the same problem and looking at it from different angles, from the government and from the private sector, could actually learn from each other, uh, potentially finding common ground. And that's true not only uh, in, the, in, the, in the realm of criminal law, but perhaps even more so when you think about the sprawling bureaucracy of the administrative state, of which uh, the FCC is a part. Um, within the FCC itself, uh, there are what could you know, often be described as kind of a Byzantine uh, collection of different bureaus and offices, starting with uh, the, the chairman or now the chairwoman's office, uh, the individual commissioner's offices, you have subject matter bureaus that are experts in particular topics, like wireless would be most applicable here, but there's media, traditional wireline, enforcement. Uh, and then you've got the offices, which do kind of the, 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 the back end work, like my office, the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, Office of General Counsel. You've got an office um, involving uh, economics, an office involving engineers. A uh, total of 1,500 people employed by the FCC. And one of the things that surprised me from the very start was just how many people we employed and just how much uh, our tentacles kind of stretch into so many of just the ordinary business uh, operations of folks in the communications space. So knowing your regulator, having a successful strategy, it can make or break your business goals. And to cite just one recent example in the news, the Media Bureau's decision to designate for hearing uh, the recent Tegna Standard General broadcast deal is potentially jeopardizing a multi-billion dollar transaction. So understanding how the FCC works is critically important. And of course, it's not just the F FCC. I mean, if you, Dario's presentation uh, pointed to uh, actions that the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, has taken. Those are maybe the two most important regulators in the mobile space. But you've got the SEC, CF, uh, PB, the whole kind of alphabet soup of federal agencies. Um, and in the spectrum space particularly, you have every federal agency that has some claim to some piece of spectrum policy, whether it's the Department of Defense, the, uh, the NOAA for the weather, the Department of Commerce, and TIA. It can, often, uh, it, it can often remind you a little bit of the galactic empire. Um, and it's not just the federal government. We're seeing increasing enforcement activity in the robocalling space on behalf of all 50 state AGs uh, in their recent AG robocall task force. So as we think about trust in the network, we're naturally led to the question of whether we have trust in the regulators. Should we look to regulators to instill confidence in consumers, or should we look to the people in this room? Should we look to the innovators, the entrepreneurs who are building the next generation mobile networks. And I think hearkening back to that example about the prosecutors and the defense bar, uh, trust really comes from honest and productive dialogue and partnership between the two. So I want to talk about some of the uh, practical and political challenges, but also opportunities 
in this space of network trust or network security. So when you think about this suite of issues, everything from national security to robocall mitigation to privacy, cybersecurity, I mean, one defining characteristic here is there is broad consensus on goals. We all want secure networks. This isn't an area like uh, content moderation, Section 230, where there's sort of a sharp political divide. Do we want more or less moderation? What shape should that look like? I'm not aware of any pro-robocalling lobbying uh, uh, trade association in D.C. And our, uh, our law firm office used to be on K Street, so I think we'd know about it if it was there. Um, but it's the exact opposite. The commissioners, the number one complaint they hear on the road at town halls is make the robocalls stop. It's, uh, it's an imperative that they're constantly hearing from consumers. Um, but despite those sort of shared public policy objectives, there's certainly a lot of good faith disagreement on implementation and how to achieve the goals. Do we rely on government mandates or do we rely on public-private partnerships or voluntary private initiatives? Who has the legal authority to adopt such rules? Um, are certain approaches technically or economically feasible? Are they going to work? So the challenge in this space is making those second order arguments to federal regulators in ways that will resonate and persuade and not make it appear that you're simply trying to avoid solutions to the problem. Uh, and there are certain headwinds here. So first, no federal regulator wants to be held responsible for the next data breach or public safety or national security incident. Uh, so that leads regulators to be naturally cautious in these areas. I think as a rule, they'd rather err a little bit on the side of over-regulation, even if that means placing some additional costs on providers. Uh, second, I think there's a, a little bit of a gravitational pull in a pro-regulatory direction in this area after some of the reforms that we put in place uh, in the prior administration under Chairman Pai. So, uh, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that, um, you know, under Chairman Pai, we uh, successfully reclassified broadband as a Title I service, sort of a light touch, uh, more deregulatory regime. And we also, for the first time, uh, classified text messages the same way under Title I, providing regulatory certainty to text. Um, but I think there's some bipartisan desire at the FCC to show that in this Title I world, they still retain the necessary tools and authority to regulate networks in the spaces where it counts. And chief among those is the security space. I mean, if you look just for example at the recent uh, stir shaken orders and text messaging orders adopted this month, these are 4-0 commission orders and they follow a long line of unanimous commission orders in this space. It's not one where you, you, you tend to have a lot of political disagreement. Um, and third, I think at, at this moment in time at the FCC, for those of you who don't know, it is currently a split ideologically. It is a 2-2 commission, uh, even partisan divide. Never would have imagined when I left the commission in 2021 uh, that uh, we still would not have a fifth commissioner here coming into the spring of 2023. Uh, but given that, I think there is also sort of a bipartisan desire there to show that even in its current state, uh, the commission can function, it can accomplish important goals, and uh, can find common ground. And so where do you start in a politically balanced commission to find common ground and network security and integrity, this, this set of issues is a good place to start, which I think is one reason you're seeing a lot of activity recently in this space. Uh, so how should the mobile ecosystem think about regulatory engagement in this environment? Uh, well, there's an old saying at the FCC that in order to have a quorum at any meeting, all you need is uh, one engineer, one economist, and one lawyer. And most of the FCC's employees fall into one of these categories. Uh, so when you're interfacing with the FCC, you need to learn to speak the language of engineers, economists, and lawyers. Uh, so I'll start with the engineers. Uh, so OET, the Office of Engineering Technology, it's one of the most respected in the building people care about what they have to say, uh, because they're responsible for making sure that spectrum policy protects against harmful interference. You can have all sorts of adverse public safety consequences from air traffic control to first responders to defense, national defense applications. They're responsible for ensuring that cell phone radiation stays within acceptable limits. 
Uh, and more generally, they're just there to show that the FCC's policies will actually work in practice. No one wants to adopt standards that will render technology inoperable or fail to solve uh, the problem at issue. Um, but OET's output, and this is true of the agency generally, it's only as good as the input that industry stakeholders provide. And one of the best things uh, that companies can do in this space, and what you all are doing in this space, is to try to tackle some of these public policy problems proactively through voluntary initiatives that deliver tangible results that the commission can then feel comfortable either adopting as the industry standard or modifying it uh, to make it the regulatory standard. As I wrote in a recent uh, post for TJ's blog, which you should, which you should read if you don't, um, you want to become the solution uh, before the agency tells you that you're the problem. Um, and uh, so, you know, in this space, we have many such examples already. The stir shaken uh, call authentic authentication standard, the industry traceback group, CTIA's voluntary initiatives on secure messaging, on political texts, on network resiliency. There, there are a number of, of, uh, of examples where these have either ultimately been adopted into commission rules or they've been modified, but they've sort of been, been taken as the baseline for what the commission does. Now, with respect to the economists, uh, there's sort of a new world at the FCC. Chairman Pai put in place for the first time an Office of Economics and Analytics, uh, which formalized cost-benefit review of major rules at the agency. So like OET, OEA is composed of talented professionals, but they rely on interested stakeholders to provide them with the necessary data to evaluate the pros and cons of different proposals. So companies that have an interest in rulemaking should make a concerted effort to uh, put quantitative evidence in the record where possible that show the costs and the countervailing benefits of different regulatory approaches. And sometimes where it's worth uh, the investment, that could even mean retaining an expert economist for statistical analysis. The FCC has a legal obligation to consider those comments and not just to ignore them, uh, not just to choose any regulatory approach, but to choose the one that essentially maximizes net benefits. If there's two approaches that will yield the same benefits, but one is significantly more costly, they need to choose the one that is, that is less costly. And if they don't adequately explain what they're doing, or if they don't adequately consider the evidence you're putting in the record, that could be a basis to overturn the commission's action in court. And that brings us to the third category, the lawyers. One thing I've found is that sometimes regulated parties have a fear of making legal arguments uh, to the government for a number of reasons. Uh, they don't want to appear adversarial. They want to maintain a long-term, positive, collegial relationship with the regulator. Or they don't want to be perceived as publicly fighting a broadly shared objective, right? And I think this can be particularly sensitive when we're talking about these network security issues. Uh, but the reality is it's a disservice both to the agency and the public to ignore legal arguments. No one benefits when an agency veers outside the area that Congress has entrusted to it into areas where it lacks substantive expertise, into areas where it will make a rule legally vulnerable and it will get mired up in litigation and that will lead to regulatory uncertainty in this space. Um, and then internally, uh, as the former chief legal officer at the agency, I can say that uh, my attorneys and I would always look to the comment record to see what people were saying about legal authority arguments because we cared about trying to craft the most legally defensible order possible. And that would sometimes mean making recommendations to the commission that it couldn't do things in this way, couldn't get 100% of what it wanted. It could get 75% of it wanted if it did it this way and did it lawfully. Um, and to the extent that there are sensitivities about putting uh, comments in the record under your own name, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful role that trade associations play in this context. They speak with one voice for the industry and they're often the fight, uh, they often are the face of the fight in court uh, when rules get challenged. Um, so taking this a bit down from the level of theory to practice, talk about a couple upcoming opportunities uh, for regulatory engagement that are on the horizon. And the time of this talk I think is fortuitous because just this month, two of the six items on the FCC's agenda dealt uh, with issues that matter to the people in this room. 
uh, one dealing with uh, spam robotext, the other dealing with robocalls. Um, so uh, perhaps uh, more importantly, uh, th this was the first time that the FCC has ever uh, taken action, actually putting rules in place uh, aimed at mitigating spam robotexts. Uh, so the, the rule had two components. First, the FCC requires blocking of text messages that appear to come from phone numbers uh, that are unlikely, that are, that are likely to be illegal, and that includes invalid, unallocated, or unused numbers. Um, and second, the rule uh, requires providers, or really requires consumers to have access to a point of contact to um, uh, express concerns if legitimate traffic is, is, is getting blocked accidentally. Um, now, getting back to sort of the rules of engagement, there was, uh, there was uh, trade association involvement, CTIA filed comments, and as often happens, um, they got some of what they wanted, they didn't get everything that they wanted. Uh, they made the case that voluntary initiatives in this space were already doing the trick, um, that uh, in fact, as the FCC acknowledged in its order, that for many large providers, these rules were unlikely to have incremental benefits because a lot of the voluntary work in mitigating text was already was already um, taking care of the lion's share of the problem. Uh, but they didn't get that, the FCC adopted the rules. But there were other areas in which there were improvements made during really the last three weeks of the process. So Chairman Pai put in place this process called the Transparency Initiative, and very few federal agencies, I'm not sure if any other federal agency does this, but three weeks before the vote, um, you can get a look at the full text of the proposed rule, and you've got one last shot to come in. You've got two weeks to come in and say, hey, I don't like this, I like that, could you tweak this? And the agency is responsive to those concerns. So, I mean, for example, with respect to this robo-texting order, the original language was very broad, said it applied not just to illegal, but also unwanted robocalls, however defined. Obviously vague, very difficult from an administrability perspective, the commission uh, removed that language. The original draft said, uh, we're going to require you to designate a single point of contact for consumer concerns, right? And then, the, and then people came in and said, well, that's going to be very difficult. There's a lot of people responsible for originating text, not just the provider. We rely on contracting partners. We rely on aggregators. Um, this is too onerous. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and that was modified to now that consumers have to have a, a point of contact, they need to have the, this available to them wherever it is, but there's more flexibility in the joint so that it doesn't need to be a single person responsible for all of a provider's texts. Um, similar story um, with respect to the most recent uh, call authentication order. Uh, this is an area in which the commission has been acting incrementally, continues to use that language in this order of acting incrementally but previously had um, extended stir shake and authentication obligations to originating providers, to gateway pro providers who are, who are handling foreign traffic, and now in this most recent order, uh, basically extending those obligations to providers at the second hop who are, who are taking the traffic from the originating provider. But this, I think, was another sort of success story of the use of trade associations during the common process, U.S. Telecom and others, commented on the scope of these obligations, uh, which as originally proposed, would have required everyone in the call path uh, to adopt uh, the authentication standard. And so they persuaded the commission to say it's not necessary, it would be costly, it would have all sorts of implementation challenges. So the commission agreed and says, we're going to act incrementally, we're going to evaluate this, we're going to require the second hop to do it. Let's see if that solves the problem. Let's see what sort of implementation challenges uh, develop. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's a story of at least partial success in terms of advocacy before the commission, but it also shows you where the next opportunities are. Because in both of these cases, the commission said, well, we are going to notice further questions uh, for the public to weigh in on. So for example, um, with respect to spam texts, they're now asking, should we extend the do not call registry to text? Should we uh, close the so-called uh, lead generator loophole? So there's a single consent, but that consent then applies to a lot of different people sending the traffic. Um, in the stir shaken context, they are asking questions like, to what extent are third party authentication tools working? Should we be permitting providers to rely on them? Are they doing more harm than good? These are all areas that speak to the experiences of people in this room and where people in this room, I think, 
have perspectives to bear on these questions and can put evidence in the record that the commission will then need to grapple with to try to create rules that will work uh, for the whole industry. Uh, so to some extent, this is a call to action. Uh, I'd love uh, you know, for all of you to talk to your um, uh, legal and regulatory folks, um, if that's not you in the room, and to seriously consider uh, participating in these upcoming rulemakings to help shape your own regulatory destiny. Um, and there's, the way that it works at the commission is there's sort of a two-step process. It'll get published in the Federal Register relatively soon. There's uh, 30 days for comments, and there's kind of a second round um, 60 days uh, for reply comments. Uh, so I hope um, it's helped to hear from the former regulator in the room, and I hope that these tips will help you the next time uh, you or your colleagues are in the room with the regulators. But thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions in Nepal? Hi, I'm Inderpal from .gov. Um, I have a, a, a question related to the type of uh, regulatory power that FCC has. Yeah. I mean, we talk a lot about uh, spam texting, spam calls, robocalls. But as a whole, technological landscape has shifted towards OTT and uh, data services. How does the FCC view that, and how do you view that uh, uh, being in the purview of regulatory? Because all of the texting, business texting, business calling is shifting to OTT more and more so. Yeah. I mean, it's a big problem. I mean, this is a, this is a problem generally with having a sector-specific agency and a sector-specific agency whose legal authorities are sort of mired really back in 1996. 1996 was the last time that the Communications Act um, underwent any sort of significant overhaul, and it was for the dawn of the Internet age. <laughs> And uh, I was in the wake of, um, you know, the, the breakup of uh, AT&T and dealing with, uh, you know, more deregulatory impulses and just an entirely different world. Um, and so um, this is a problem that, that uh, kind of uh, haunts every FCC rulemaking, and it was part of this rulemaking, which is that what sense does this policy make if it's only going to be applied uh, to SMS or, or, right, or, or, or the, the limited number of technologies that the Commission actually has jurisdiction over because as of now, the Commission doesn't have a theory uh, or, or, or has not yet been so bold as to articulate a theory as to how they get to over the top applications. And that matters not just in this area, um, matters for example in the net neutrality debate. Right? It's the idea about who's actually doing the blocking and throttling that we care about as we sit here in 2023. And you saw a slide about uh, you know, uh, what, what are the trust problems that consumers have. A lot of concerns, obviously, about the app ecosystem, the social media ecosystem, the content ecosystem. That's a, you know, you're not seeing as much that you know, AT&T is blocking my favorite website, Verizon's blocking my favorite website. And the problem here, though, is that the FCC has a limited jurisdiction. So it can only attack or only even address part of the problem. Um, so, um, the, the reality is they tend to get away with it because it's the, you know, their, their answer is that's the limit of our jurisdiction, but you're certainly right that it doesn't make much sense as a public policy solution, which is part of the reason why under Chairman Pai, we tried to shift some of these questions to agencies that had more, more general jurisdiction. I mean, if you look at the FTC, for example, it can take a more surgical case-by-case -case enforcement-based approach, and it's not limited to only dealing with one set of players within this ecosystem. Um, Eddie has a question. Yeah. So you said you, <clears throat> when you guys um, changed SMS from that whole Twilio thing and it moved from Title II to Title I, and I didn't disagree with the ruling on the A to P messaging, but when I read through the ruling in the footnotes, you included P to P messaging in there, so person to person messaging under the footnote section of the of the ruling which can be interpreted that if the carrier doesn't like a certain individual they can block that subscribers messages to another individual which would violate the whole premise of equal access and you know communication between two individual people and I, I just was wondering why that footnote or that section wasn't changed and why P2P messaging, P2P messaging wasn't put in 
as a Title II regulation, like a phone call. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, candidly, I don't recall the thinking behind that particular footnote. Um, you know, what I can say is, I mean, text, like a lot of services that have evolved over the past, you know, whether it's 10, 20, 30 years, um, they don't, you know, they, they're, they're coming in from the ground up and they don't come in with a regulatory status sort of attached to them. So it's really the commission's job to classify them. So in the case of text, there really had been no prior classification decision as to whether it was Title II or Title I. Um, and so uh, what the commission said, and what we thought was consistent with the general deregulatory goals of the 1996 Act, um, were, was to uh, treat this as a service that was developing, that was still uh, growing, um, and sort of the, the general presumption at least in the prior administration, was that um, you don't put sort of heavy-handed Title II regulations on those sort of developing and emerging services. I mean, even if in particular cases there might be problems, as you suggest, the way that we said is that in those particular cases, if a carrier is doing something that might be deceptive, if it's doing something that might be discriminatory, if it's doing something that might be an unfair business practice, you have both the FTC uh, and the state consumer generals to uh, state attorney generals that could deal with that in particular cases. But the problem with Title II classification, this gets back to the discussion about kind of the, the limits on the commission's authority. Um, yes, as you say, I mean, there is that uh, sort of non-discrimination non idea that's built into 201 and 202, but there's a lot else that's in Title II. Um, there's enforcement, very you know, strict enforcement under 208. Um, there's interconnection agreement, uh, interconnection obligations and things like that. To classify something as a Title II service, tariffing obligations, to classify something as a Title II service, it either requires that you submit that service to, to that whole panoply of regulations, or you do something that um, the FCC calls forbearance, which means they do have the authority to say, for this particular service, you don't need to do X, Y, and Z. But when you do that, you're putting yourself in your service um, sort of at the mercy of federal regulators. And what we found, for example, with broadband was that a lot of the small, uh, a lot of the small wireless companies, the WISPs, for example, that provide service uh, to the rural parts of the country, they couldn't deal with the regulatory uncertainty that came with Title II classification. And I suspect a lot of those same concerns also you know, apply in the messaging space. Many uh, organizations operating in the telco space, building on top of telco networks, are uh, multinational. And I'm curious, to what extent does the FCC look at actions like the EU Digital Markets Act or the Australia Scam Act as driving changes in the industry that they may want but maybe aren't prepared to enforce? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of ways in which I think the FCC, you know, looks to what's going, going on outside of the, the country. I mean, as I said, I mean, one, one big technical challenge that they've had to deal with recently was sort of what do you do about foreign originated traffic? I mean, and so I think that, um, you know, led to the gateway provider order some months back in which sort of the, a, 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 sort of the, the first domestic provider would have some obligation to ensure that that traffic was authenticated. Um, this is also a big issue for the Commission in the national security space. I mean, we work closely with other components of the federal government, um, like CFIUS, like the, the national security agencies, uh, to ensure, for example, that when there are transactions in the telecom space that involve some foreign ownership component, that those are reviewed, that there are no problems from a national security perspective. There's that special review process that needs to happen before those things are okayed. Um, and then there was a series of orders that started when I was general counsel and are still, um, are still ongoing, uh, dealing with what do we do about the threat of uh, foreign equipment in our networks, of the threat of some of the backdoor capabilities that foreign providers who wish to do us harm um, uh, would, would place into network equipment. And so the very first step that we took under Chairman Pai was we under our sort of we, the federal subsidy programs that we administer. We decided that certain 
companies and met certain criteria with an established, uh, established um, uh, history of engaging in this kind of, of, of conduct, surveillance conduct, uh, would not be eligible for subsidies. And so it was an effort to try to get that out of the network. Um, following that, Congress actually acted and gave us further authority uh, to remove that type of equipment. Um, and now uh, the, the FCC is building on that and, and taking further action to try to get it out. Um, but you know, it's another one of these issues that deal with jurisdiction. I mean, we either need to incorporate uh, foreign law directly into our own rules in some way, um, or we need uh, to um, you know, engage in kind of bilateral discussion. So we do have an international bureau. Um, they travel all around the world. They go to, um, you know, there are, you know, uh, conferences of uh, similar leaders and they do enter into treaties. And that was kind of a, a fun, I would sometimes get a call from the head of the international bureau at two in the morning. And then my first thought was, is he, uh, does he need to be extradited? Is he in a, is he in a holding cell somewhere? But it was just a time difference and needed a, a, a legal question about some uh, bilateral agreement he was going to enter into. But um, that, was a, that was a fun part of the job. Hi, thank you for being here today, Thomas. Uh, just really trying to understand the privacy part of communications at the same time as trying to determine what regulators are really looking for. Because in state regulations, you have things like privacy protection. And in the federal side, let's say on the voice side, you're talking about uh, CP&I on the voice side of uh, communications providers. But as soon as you get a second attribute, like messaging, like we're all here about, uh, how does the government, or in your experience, the regulators look at that separation of uh, privacy and, in some cases, uh, censorship? Yeah, I mean, well, this is, this is another area in which there is likely to be, and there now is, kind of um, regulatory bifurcation because of the limitations and authority that you point to. So there is a rulemaking that's currently pending before the FCC talking about um, whether to expand um, voice providers' obligations beyond CPNI because of these privacy concerns. Not how the commission would put it, but um, you know, can we get towards what, what sort of customer personally identifiable information? Can we get beyond that, or certain information just about about really about the call, right? About the call itself into personally other types of personal identifying information like social security numbers, health information personal information, the type of stuff that, that consumers care about that the FCC can't really get to very easily because it's outside the scope of this authority. Um, now there are, uh, there are, I think, from an industry perspective, efforts on Capitol Hill that would try to solve this problem, that would create, that would, would kind of create one regulator, whether that's the FTC or whatever, that would actually have ownership of the entire ecosystem. Right? In the meantime, it's hard when you've got an FCC that's very limited. Um, and as you say, you've got other regulators, including the states and the FTC, um, with broader jurisdiction. But it's, not, it's obviously not what consumers care about. Co consumers just care about getting their data, uh, having their data protected. But as a result, you know, there's some push for the federal regulators to push the limits of their authority to show, hey, we're doing something about this. And I think that's one area that, you know, where we could definitely see litigation in the coming years. Yeah. Thank you very much. Tom.